So thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. And this is um, uh, simple and scalable microservices um, um, uh, with, by using uh, NATS and the Docker tooling and how they fit together. Um, just an introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Valdemar Quevedo. I'm a software developer at Absera, uh, where I do the development of the uh, Absera Trusted Platform. Uh, for a further background, in the past I was doing uh, development operations for a large e-commerce website in Japan uh, that was using a Cloud Foundry. And that's how I basically became familiar with doing, uh, using NATS as it has had it as a part of its control plane. And I'm also a, a maintainer of a couple of the NATS client libraries for Ruby based on Event Machine and Python 2, Python 3 with Tornado and AsyncIO respectively. And uh, things I want to cover in this talk is uh, share to you, um, uh, first of what is NATS, what are some of the features uh, behind NATS, and basically uh, sharing about like uh, using uh, NATS and Docker uh, together. And so first thing is um, uh, how many of you are familiar uh, with NATS? Nice. Uh, um, okay, so um, put it very succinctly, uh, um, NATS is uh, fast and simple, uh, reliable messaging. So, uh, so yeah, I, I saw this uh, generate from last week and had to use it. And yeah, it's a high-performance uh, messaging system. It was created by uh, Derek Collison, uh, the CEO of Absera, and he was first uh, written in Ruby in 2010, originally by uh, uh, for Cloud Foundry. Uh, then it was rewritten in Go in 2012, uh, and that made it like a, it, it already had like a decent performance with Ruby, like 150,000 messages per second, but with the Go rewrite, it just became like, like very, very fast. It is open source under the MIT license. You can find it under the NATS.io uh, organization. It is um, in, used in production by many companies. Uh, well, in Absera, we use it, uh, Ericsson, HTC, uh, General Electric, Baidu, among some others. Uh, one of the peculiarities on NATS is that it, is, uh, it, it had the strain that was kept constrained so that it's uh, operationally simple and reliable as possible, but wouldn't have uh, compromising uh, performance and scalability, right? So, um, so. That is kind of like the main trait uh, from NATS. One of the goals from the project is that it tries to act as a always available dial tone that you can use uh, in order to communicate throughout your uh, services. And so it is fast. And uh, this could be a it's a micro benchmark, but it could be quite impressive. I uh, use the uh, NATS bench tool available in the repo, uh, sending 100 million uh, messages per second. We got it at throughput of around 10 million messages per second. So it's, uh, it's, it's very fast. Um, it's also uh, simple, so uh, as I was saying. And in terms of the des main uh, design, uh, it is only pure publish subscribe. So it doesn't have a uh, built-in persistence of messages compared like to other messaging systems. And it doesn't give you these uh, exactly once uh, delivery promises, uh, guarantees. Uh, instead, like the design was uh, simplified and kept away uh, from that. So if you're interested in having similar features uh, around like at least once delivery and those kind of concerns, then there's another project which uh, is a layer on top of NATS and tries to give you replaying of uh, messages and, um, and so it basically beats on top of NATS and it's named NATS streaming is available and open source as well. Uh, but in terms of NATS, the core of the design is uh, it's, um, it chooses uh, TCP IP uh, to have an always established connection to the server and over this always established connection to the server, you use a very simple uh, plain text protocol with a few number of commands, and it is a find and forget uh, system. This means that uh, in order for a message to really make it to the a subscriber, it has to be uh, connected at the moment that uh, that server is uh, routing that message. So, in terms of uh, delivery guarantees, you could say it's an, an at most one uh, delivery. And this uh, it is a very simple protocol. 
is uh, based in plain text, so these are just a, a subscription, the hello subject, you give an arbitrary uh, identifier, one, then you publish uh, on the hello subject, uh, sending five bytes, and you're basically sending to yourself in this example uh, um, five bytes in the uh, world example, mm. and then ping and pong. And so yeah, this is a full uh, protocol here. Uh, can give you a quick uh, example. Um, so you, you can try it uh, on your own as well. This uh, There's a publicly available endpoint you can use to play with the protocol. Yeah, this is, uh, is, is can everyone see this? Um, yeah, so yeah, this is um, subscription on the hello subject and sending uh, Bytes, the world, that's it. I can unsubscribe from this subject. Yeah, hello. Uh, and think, okay, so, and, and it's very uh, strict in terms of following the protocol. So if you don't give up a uh, well-formed protocol, it will just disconnect you, which is a, a theme with the server. It tries to protect itself from any Kind of client that is uh, having a bad behavior within the system. So, presentation. Um, because we have a very simple uh, protocol, then the clients tend to be very simple. Uh, they don't tend to be uh, very complex. Uh, we have a um, good number of amount of clients now since uh, it was originally developed. The, Canonical implementation now is the Go client, uh, which is the other, what the uh, other clients try to catch up to uh, get the full feature set that a client ha should have. And this is the APIs for basic publish subscribe. The original client was uh, in Ruby using the event machine. Uh, there's a native async IO Python 3 client, so uh, I don't know how many of you are using Python 3, I'm really curious. Okay. Well, it's available. Uh, uh, native async IO based, uh, Node.js, of course. Uh, there's even a C client now, which is uh, very fast. Um, uh, C sharp um, also available, and it's officially supported by the Nats team. Same with a Java client and uh, many uh, other contributed by the uh, community. I mean, one of these. Uh, Interesting one is the, the one from Nginx. So this is what we use instead of the uh, AppSera platform so that the Nginx, it is hooked into the messaging system and then dynamically knows where to reverse proxy the traffic by not having to do any configuration reloading or they're you know, uh, relying on another thing. It just, uh, the platform just like publishes into the Nginx and it creates the, the routes to be able to uh, route the traffic to the application. So it has a great community, and it has been uh, getting good uh, contributions um, since um, I think it has getting more contributions last year. There are um, it's a growing ecosystem, uh, things like uh, Telegraph plugins, uh, AWS Nets, um, uh, Logros integrations. Um, there is uh, now connectors, so you know, um, you can pipe your data that is going through NATS to many other different systems like uh, Spark. There are a couple of uh, Spark Docker containers, uh, Flame 2D as well. There's an official uh, NATS connector framework, uh, which is using Java. And also a couple of uh, uh, contributed dashboards uh, as well. And uh, it's an, NATS itself is uh, an official image. Uh, it's one of the um, one of the few first uh, official images that is a single binary uh, with very few layers. So it's only seven megabytes and uh, yeah, uh, millions of goals. And we start to see more activity on the uh, community on creating interesting uh, containers. And it's in the Docker store now too. So, so yeah. Uh, but in terms of the features um, uh, from NATS, uh, so again, as I, I was just mentioning, it's a pure publish subscribe system. Uh, so, but you do have um, an option to do one-to-one 
uh, kind of communication by using uh, request reply, but it's still pure poly subscribe. You have uh, subject routing using wildcards, using Q groups, uh, clustering for high availability, and there is an exposed monitoring endpoint and uh, secure TLS connections by doing a start TLS when you connect. Uh, touching a little bit on the way that uh, request reply uh, works in Nets, uh, because it's quite uh, uh, interesting the way it does it, it um, basically creates this uh, unique identifier uh, ephemeral description, uh, subscriptions. And then you tell the server that you have limited interest in a subscription. So here what we're telling the server is um, uh, creating an, uh, this uh, unique uh, string, uh, labeling the subscription with the subscription, subscription identifier number two, then signaling the server that we only want to receive a single message on this subscription. And after doing this, then we make the request, okay? And basically we're publishing on the help subject, uh, using this uh, tagging, the, the publish with the ephemeral subject, and telling the server how many bytes to read from the client. Um, then if, um, if there is someone connected into the system and interested in helping into the subject, then it will be receiving a help message and perceiving this uh, subscription uh, reading, following for, by the six bytes. And if it's willing to help, uh, it can reply directly into this uh, uh, client, doing, effectively doing one-to-one -one communication now. Uh, here he is telling, um, uh, sending to the client, to the server 11 bytes, uh, I can help. And if the original requester is still uh, interested in the subject and uh, connected and everything uh, went well there, it will be receiving this um, uh, message on the unique subscription. So that's the way you can do both one-to-end communications, one-to-one -one type of communications, and using nothing but pure public subscribe. Um, all of the client libraries have uh, helpers to be able to create these uh, ephemeral subjects. And, but it is, used, it is already wrapped around, you have a helper method for doing these uh, request responses. In this example, you're, uh, this is the API from the Go client. Uh, making a request, make, uh, sending the payload bytes, and the payload is opaque to the server. So it could be, here you're sending bytes, where it could have been a JSON, protocol buffers, uh, message pack. So yeah, it's the basic request response. And by the definition from this uh, request response and the way it works in Nets, the response that you're getting is the one with the lowest latency. So in this example, you have a service and it's making a publish on the uh, service D subject. And by making a request, uh, expecting uh, only a single response, the fastest one to reply is going to be uh, received by the client. So it already uh, so it's very well suited for lowest latency type of communications. It has a subjects routing uh, uh, functionality, so you can use uh, asterisk to be able to map on a dot, dot separated uh, subject namespace. And in this case, we'll be matching on a foo dot asterisk bar, foo dot hello, uh, that would uh, uh, match. And for example, uh, if you, by convenience, uh, all of the clients use uh, underscore capital inboxes. So you can subscribe to all of the requests that are happening inside of the server um, by using the wildcard. And there is a stronger variation from this one, which is the full wildcard, which matches on um, any type of messages that is uh, happening inside of the server. So if you try this inside of the uh, demo endpoint, then you will see all of these uh, JSON payloads that uh, other clients are sending at this moment. There is a notion of distribution queues to be able to balance work. For example, let's say you have a, a number of API servers uh, uh, trying to uh, request for work for this uh, service, and you don't want to like broadcast and have a single uh, having to publish to uh, the same request to everyone. Instead, you want it to be like broad balance among them. Uh, so the API for this uh, queue subscription, so basically you still use uh, the subscription and then labeling a distribution group. So in this case, it's uh, workers. And 
uh, what, something to note about the way Nats is doing this is that it is not, uh, we say this not assuming the audience. By this, it, it means that you can have a service A workers, a service A helpers, on even, or even a service uh, wildcard subscription, and this would still be receiving the traffic and not affecting. Uh, so by the, the fact that you have another wildcard listening to all the traffic will not affect the traffic from, another, from the audience, right? So this is the way the distribution queue groups work in Nets. Can I go to the next slide? <laughs> I got there. Oh. there is a clustering mode as well. And here we have uh, everyone connected into um, a different NAT server. And the NAT server cluster, it is doing the routing of the messages. And so if you see, not everyone is uh, connected to the, to the same NATs, and, but they, they can still communicate from the, throughout the system. Um, so this way, in case um, one of the NATS nodes dies, then uh, all of these services will uh, kick, have the reconnection logic and then start um, talking with the, another immediately available one. Uh, something important because um, many people ask after uh, on this is that the route, the messages will only be forwarded to a uh, client um, that is, has expressed interest into this subject, right? So it's not just like um, published to everyone. It um, tries to be a little bit more smarter than that. And then I can help here is also uh, implementing the reconnection handlers and this up. Uh, uh, from recent releases, there's also a cluster auto discovery, which can help you with um, discovering all the other, other nuts within the system, not service within the system. So in this case, uh, let's say that all the services, they're just talking to the first uh, NAT server, then you have another NAT server connecting to the first one. And then as soon as this happens, then the original NAT server will uh, notify all of the clients that there is a new um, NAT server that they can fail over to. And then all of these clients will reconfigure themselves to be aware of this new node. And this happens uh, trans transparently behind the, on the, on the client engine. So this way, if the original server dies, uh, then everyone just rebalance and try to connect to another one. There is a monitoring endpoint, and I, because I'm running out of time. Uh, so the TLS, many features. So, So, and moving on to how NATS and Docker uh, play uh, together. Uh, so this is what I was mentioning about the NATS Docker image. It has very few layers and it's uh, only seven megabytes in size. So the way this is done is, uh, I think many of you uh, know already this uh, type of uh, getting this uh, type of images in size. Uh, there's basically a two step process. Um, this is the original Docker file uh, maintained by uh, Derek. Um, so here's this is the compilation step that generates the uh, binary artifact from from the NAT server, and then uh, basically we just uh, take the Docker copy this uh, binary resulting binary into a uh, from scratch container. So the end up uh, the result from this is that uh, you have a binary of this. Uh, a Docker container that's, uh, that's very small. So, uh, the Docker image has these uh, three different ports exposed. It's uh, one for the, the clients to connect to, then the other one used for the internal clustering of a protocol, and another one for to get the internal state from the server, uh, from the bar C uh, endpoint. Uh, giving some demos on using uh, NATS and Docker together, and uh, in case I'm running out of time, you can find all of the examples on this uh, repository here. Um, so the scenario here is that we'll have a, a server that you can uh, externally uh, talk, use uh, HTTP to talk against, 
and this one is connected against NETS and then communicating with a pool of workers uh, to schedule that. So this one has worked. Uh, by uh, um, making this highly available, then we will start uh, having a topology looking like this. We still only have a single API server and the workers are randomly connected to each one of the nodes, but the communication still happens. Um, this is a, uh, let's see what, oh, okay, this is an example of uh, using a Docker Compose um, to declare the an ads cluster. Basically you're saying that the, this GNETSD uh, server has routes to services, um, that's servers B and C. And because they're a full mesh one hop, they need to be connected to each other, right? Let's keep a quick example of doing this. So this is um, post. This is the same uh, Docker Compose file. Yeah, this is the same example, and everyone is. Um, Needs to know where the other, ah, it's, it's hard to see, right? Better? Okay. So, yeah, this is the way you assemble a cluster. That's uh, using Docker Compose declarations. Run this. This is an example. Um, wow. Try it again. Try, try that again. Yeah, this is the um, uh, NATS cluster now assembled together. And if I send, uh, send requests, you can have a simple loop, uh, send the request to the, the cluster. I will slow it down and send less requests, one per second. Yeah, here you have um, have this uh, container that has some um, utilities that you can use to monitor the traffic. That's server A. Yeah, so you can see now that um, receiving a Request per second right now. The system. I will. will stop the original uh, NAT server client. Say it's this one. This will cause the clients to reconnect, but the traffic is still. So this server is now dead, but they have failover to 
and this other node. So now, now in this B node, you only have the worker uh, receiving the messages. And on the server C, it is the API uh, server receiving the request and uh, sending the traffic, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, you're still receiving the requests. Um, so yeah, there's a Docker Compose. Then just to copy, uh, to recover uh, uh, using the Docker Swarm, uh, which uh, this way you can assemble um, a NATS cluster just using um, the service feature from Docker Swarm mode. Uh, so here we're doing something similar as we did with the Docker Compose declarations, where we are um, telling each um, one of the servers where to find the other uh, NAT server, and because of the auto-discovery there is happening, and there is an internal gossiping of the routes, so uh, they discover in the end where to talk to. And this, uh, this is how you can create a NATS cluster using only six lines of code. Um, because um, this, is, this is leveraging the fact that the initial NAT server is becoming like a seed server from the, the whole cluster, right? So. Um, by the time you start the initial one, uh, it will ignore its own route, so that will not cause an, an error. And then by the time like B and C uh, connect, they will uh, discover uh, each other. So I just copy paste and do this in um, B cloud environments. So right now I don't have any services. Copy paste. Yeah. Now you have a cluster from Nets, and they're talking to each other, and it's a file available and stuff. Uh, so I can create another. Container, server, subs, service, net stop. This one is running on the second node from the Docker Swarm. Screen. Stop on that's A. Right now, I don't have any client. We'll just create a new client. It's Docker exec. Swarm. Ah, I need some B. Internet into Nets uh, B. That's it. You can see how the uh, monitoring endpoint has perceived the, the new client in the system. I can give it a name, for example, if I send a connect uh, uh, command. Um, so this is at the, at the bottom what I'm doing. Uh, things. Um, Low Docker. Yeah, you can see that now I have a Hello Docker client on the server. Um, 
but yeah, that's how you can create an ads cluster. Um, we click real quick with um, Docker Swarm. And I'm out of time, but you can find all of these examples in the repo, and I will publish the slides if you want to take a look. Um, so just to summarize, uh, and that's a, a simple, fast, reliable solution for the internal communication and distributed system. Uh, and the examples are doing more complicated stuff, like having an API server and a worker and having those actually communicating, if you want to take a look. And um, yeah, Docker is flexible tooling. It's, uh, uh, it's really well with by doing NATS based uh, applications. It's a bonus. Uh, recently, the NATS streaming um, uh, player, which um, is on top of NATS, doing like at least once delivery uh, features. It's also an official uh, Docker image. It's also pretty small, it's only less than 10 megabytes. Thank you for your time. Questions? Yes. Uh, so. Uh, sure. Yeah, so it's, um. Oh wait, um, so <laughs> with NAT streaming, um, is Kafka still better at certain things? And if so, what are those things? I guess that, uh, most significant feature on that streaming is that uh, it's, uh, it's very simple. So yeah, I mean, it would be, I guess, competing on, against Kafka on those terms. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess there's a, yeah, I still don't, I don't have the accurate answer to compare uh, against Kafka. But yeah, I mean, it would be, there's a subset of functionality that, uh, NAT streaming can be suited for uh, compared to Kafka as well. So, yeah, yeah you, you can take a look at NAT streaming as well if you're considering Kafka. <laughs> yeah, there are certs as well, if anyone wants. Okay. Yes. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. If you've used the distribution queue groups, for example, yeah, you have this uh, random load balancing. Yes, yeah, yeah. There are some uh, community tools for building NATS clusters in Kubernetes as well. Right. How does NATS do across a wide area network? Uh, so is it reliable, responsive? What happens if you have loss? Things like that. Yeah. Um, it's a, uh, well, it would give you the same uh, guarantees as, um, it is a TCP, right? So I guess. Uh, so it's TCP, so. not UDP. Uh -huh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so. And so do we get access to the TCP layer to set things like uh, Lingo and socket options that we can tune it for for high latency links? Uh, I think right now it's not exposing the APIs from, I, I guess it can depend on the client. Um, I'm actually not, not familiar with this one, yeah. Uh -huh. Is there any way to pull metrics? Say, uh, say somebody comes to me and I'm, I'm using it for, I don't know, communicating with an external vendor, and they say, hey, I want to know how many orders a vendor placed on whatever day. Is there any way to see metrics for how many messages came through or anything like that? Uh, so yeah, I mean that's the I didn't cover. I just kind of skipped it because it's running out of time. But there's a monitoring endpoint, so you can get the. Uh, metrics about uh, the subscriptions and how many messages per second they're receiving and uh, it tracks all of these per connection as well. So you can see uh, what is, given this connection ID, how many subscriptions a certain client has and how many messages and bytes per second is sending. So yeah, all, all of that is exposed and uh, yeah, 
It's uh, another one. Any more questions? Uh, no. <laughs> no, I mean, no, no. I think the original Ruby server used to have, but in the rewrite, uh, I think yeah, there's no explicit health in any point. Yeah, but there's bar C, and it's like a classic, right? <laughs> yeah, if I click this, uh, Things, yeah, this is the bar C metrics. Uh, oh, sub C. We have a slash. On C endpoints. Um, yeah, we have a Go clients, a couple of Python 2 subscribers. What else is there? There is. Um, Oh, yeah, node clients, I remember. Yeah, so, yeah, I have this tool named uh, NetStop, which is doing uh, all in these endpoints and getting all of this information on the server. So, yeah, here, NetStop. This is the current, currently connected clients to the demo website, so. Can make sorting. Who has sent the most messages? It's a Go client. Has been running for five days. Other questions? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you very yeah. much, Polly. <laughs>